So let's take a look at what we got here. Um, we'll go through the parts before we do the install. Uh, we're going to start with the fuel pump. This is a 12 305. Um, arguably, way too much pump for a six cylinder. This is a 255 liter per hour pump. Um, that's a lot, and I have the feeling it's going to be noisy. Some folks say that it is, some folks that say that it isn't. Um, I decided I was just going to give it a shot. Um, usually in tank pumps aren't too loud. Um, I've run a 255 liter per hour pump on my truck. It's external and it's not that loud, so we'll see. Um, originally I had thought, based on the documentation I had seen, that this was 3 eighths. It says that it was 3 eighths. Uh, it looks to me like it's 3 eighths and it steps down to 5 sixteenths, which is not good because I was going to convert the whole thing over to um, 3 eighths, which is what that fuel line is there. I'm going to show that next. Um, but it looks to me like it's got two steps in it. I should be able to get it. I don't know this. Uh, I don't know if this is supposed to be just a stop or if it's supposed to allow you to put a three eighths. And there's enough room for a clamp here, so we'll see how the Earl's Vapor Lock hose, which I also have, um, designed for ethanol fuel. Uh, here in California, we have 10% ethanol fuel only. There is no option for other otherwise anymore. Um, so. Uh, you want to run that. If you're going to run hose that you don't want it to disintegrate over time, you need to run that Earl's Vapor Lock. I think there's some other brands out there that do it as well, but um, that's the one that explicitly says it'll work with ethanol. Anyways, this is a drop-in replacement. It's a cool unit. Um, it's got the, there's the pickup down there. They call it a hydromat. It's supposed to take place of what would normally be a baffle in a tank. Um, this sits in the original spot that the ascending unit would be in, so it's a drop-in replacement. It comes with three different uh, floats. The one that's installed on it is for the standard 16-gallon tank. Uh, if you go to the other tanks, I forget what the other two are, if it's 22-gallon, I'm not sure. But there are two other tanks that are larger capacity. It comes with the arms for it if you do want to run a larger tank. Um, they have the C, and I think the other one's a 305B. So anyways, it tells you what they're all for. Um, it, but it comes with the standard 16-gallon tank on it, so I don't need to um, change the arm. So anyways, that's a fuel pump module. Um, this is from Classic Tubes, 3 8 line. I'm going to replace my 5 16 line. Um, it comes pre-bent. There is a shipping bend right where that yellow flag is. I just straightened it out, though. Um, just a big loop in it. Uh, so I straightened that out already, um, and I was looking at the line that's in there. It looks like it's pretty darn close to what's in there, so that hopefully won't be too hard to install. And then we have the um, sniper unit here. This is the Sniper 1100 unit or 11 Auto Light 1100 Direct Replacement unit. Most of the folks that are familiar with the six cylinders are aware of these these days. Um, so we're going to give this thing a shot. Um, I got a lot of experience doing fuel injection systems, so um, it doesn't scare me at all to do this. Um, but what I am going to tell you, just as you would with uh, anything, or you should, which a lot of people don't, and this is where problems arise, and I'm going to give you some pointers in this install as I do it as well. Follow the instructions. Read the instructions. Now, I know a lot about Phytech units. I've actually never used the snipers before, um, but they're very similar. Uh, I still went through and I read the whole manual um, just to see what kind of oddities there are. It's very similar to the Phytech units, but there are some differences um, in the way that they want you to set it up, which is fine. Um, so just make sure you read the manual because that's, I'm telling you, nine times out of ten, that's where the problems are um, in electronic fuel injection. A lot of guys are carb guys and, you know, they're real good mechanics, but they don't deal with electronics a whole lot. Um, you know, these things are more sensitive. I've talked about that in other videos before. They're, you know, you can't get dirt in them. So, you know, I'm going to give you some pointers like flushing the line first before we hook it up to the unit. Um, you know, uh, some cleanliness things, some wiring things. So we'll go over all that as we do the install. Um, I'll do my best to kind of cover everything as much as possible. Um, but, you know, if there's anything I leave out, make sure you check the comments down below because a lot of times I think of things and I put them down in the, in the uh, description of the video. So 
you know, just make sure you check for those if there's anything I think of later. Um, so anyways, we're going to go ahead and get rolling on this. Um, we're going to be installing this in my 66 Mustang. Um, and, uh, you know, the most difficult part probably is going to be putting the fuel pump and the uh, line in the car just because it's underneath and that's a real pain in the ass. Um, I do have about five gallons of fuel left. I've burned up most of the whole tank. Um, it's already got a brand new tank in it. I was going to leave it carbureted, so I bought a standard tank for it. That's the purpose of using this module, and I already forgot to mention something. There is no return line with this module. It's got a built-in regulator right here. It's a four-bar regulator, which is 58 PSI. It's built into the unit. I called Holly, and I said, can you deadhead that long? Because it's going to be deadheaded from here all the way up, which means there's no return. So that means that you have to prime the line before you hook it up to the unit otherwise you'd be cranking on it for an hour um, because normally in a return circuit the pump's gonna it's gonna be able to bypass all the way back to the tank without it running on a on the prime of the pump so i'm gonna prime it manually first before i do anything and i want to flush the line but it like i said it is regulated right here it, it dumps right back into the tank um so uh, you don't need to use the regulator on the unit. It means you cap the regulator. Now, I know the manual says you must run a return line. That's assuming that you don't have a regulator before it. Um, deadheading is real common. There's a lot of guys that use the fuel command centers from Phytech, um, which is nothing more than a tiny fuel tank with a high-pressure pump in it that's fed by a low-pressure pump. It's for the guys that don't want a tank uh, with an in-tank you know, in pump or replace their fuel tank. They want to use their carb fuel tank. That's what those are for. They deadhead, and it's usually under the hood, so it's only a couple of feet. This is going to be deadheaded, you know, I don't know, 160 inches or something like that. So it's going to be interesting to see if this works. I'm using it kind of as an experiment. You know, Holly says it'll work. Um, I think it'll be fine. Um, the other reason you want to run a return line, though, if you are going to do this with a new tank, I would run a return line, um, uh, is uh, it's just a better install um there's certain folks that swear by you're gonna uh you, you're gonna vapor lock <laughs> it's sort of possible but not really um with ethanol fuel vapor locking is a little bit more common but um you're running at four bars which means you're four times the pressure of atmosphere um carbs vapor lock because there is no pressure um just as uh your radiator is under pressure and water doesn't you're you're coolant even if you had water in there straight water with no eth with no ethylene glycol in it it won't boil at 212 degrees because it's under pressure um, so the same is with uh, the fuel it will not boil as easily under four bars of pressure not near as easily now i was trying to look up the charts for that uh, for ethyl you know for 10 percent ethanol fuel i actually couldn't find them real easily um, so i don't know exactly what the temperature difference is under at, under no pressure versus four bar but i can tell you for sure it's not going to boil near as easily so it should be fine um it'll be interesting to see though so anyways that's the basic components um, so we're gonna get the car over here and we're gonna uh, get it up in the air and uh we're gonna start at the back we're gonna do the fuel pump first i gotta pump the last few gallons of fuel out of the tank and uh We'll work our way forward. I'll build a wiring harness for you for it. And I'll show you guys how that's done. It does come with uh, weather pack connectors already, which is nice. It comes with the pigtail for this. Um, I will be soldering all the connections as well. Um, I don't believe in using crimps if I can avoid it. Um, so, uh, you know, hopefully this will be educational for you guys, make it a little easier if you're doing these, uh, uh, doing these swaps. I know a lot of guys want to get rid of their auto light 1100s. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm going to try and do the best install that I can with this to make sure you guys get a good uh, description and uh, idea of what it takes to do this. So we're going to proceed with the fuel pump sending unit uh, installation. Um, they have this thing called the Hydromat. <laughs> Sounds kind of gimmicky to me, but, you know, I'm sure it probably works. And it's definitely at a very specific angle, I can tell. They've engineered this in a way where you can't really screw it up. Um, so you press the hydromat on the end of the fuel pump there. Uh, it's, you got to give a little bit of pressure to get this. It's almost like one of those spring clips that, you know, is a one-way kind of a deal. Um, so make sure you get it seated all the way because it kind of pops on and you got to really push it to get it to go all the way on there. So make sure you get that snapped on there and then um, take the fuel sending unit 
and unscrew it from here because that's how you're going to finagle this into the tank. You're going to take it, we're going to put the hydromat in first, feed the pump in behind it, then once the pump's in, we're going to feed the sending unit arm in, and then we're going to screw it in when all those components are in the tank, but we still haven't seated this all the way. We'll just have this exposed. Um, I don't think I'm going to try and film this, and I'll tell you why. If you jump on Holly's website for the 12-305, there is a video of it. Go watch the video. They also recommend in the video putting masking tape around the hole. Um, I'm not going to do that because this thing's got, well, I got all the fuel out of it, but it's going to be wet with fuel. The tape's probably not going to stick to it. I'm just going to be real careful feeding this in because they tell you to be careful of it to not tear this. Um, if you tear it, it's garbage. So I'm going to be real careful putting that in. So make sure you do that, but watch that video. Um, so uh, we'll be back in a minute and I'll let you know kind of how this went and give you any pointers I learned. Well, this should uh, about sum up for you how it went installing that in the car. I actually got pretty far. Um, I got all the way to where I was trying to put the seal and the locking ring in and I just couldn't get the seal to stay put. Uh, it's just the wrong angle. So I just, you know, sucked it up and pulled the tank out. Not a big deal, and then I was able to get it, no problem. Um, so a couple of notes. Uh, they recommend using the masking tape. I started to put the hydromat in there, and I didn't like what I was seeing. I was afraid I was going to tear it, so I put masking tape on it. Um, you know, the one thing that I didn't want to happen was the masking tape ended up inside the tank, so I had to go get that. Um, not super easy. So, anyways... Uh, save yourself the trouble. Of course, most of you folks are probably putting a new tank in, but mine was already brand new. So uh, if you do want to keep your original tank, just take the darn thing out. It's just save yourself the headache. It only takes five minutes to get it out of the car. So anyways, I got the seal and the locking ring in there, and there's still a little bit of fuel in here, so I even checked it for leaks. I tipped it up on the seal face here, and uh, nothing's coming out of it, so I think it's sealed well. So... Um, I think I'm going to leave the tank out now since it's already out and I've got to put the new fuel line in. Uh, so, you know, we'll do that next. All right, so the new fuel line is in. It took a couple of hours to get the old one out. Um, first thing I'm going to note, I don't know why, and I don't know why Holly doesn't just freaking post it on their damn website, but they don't. They just say recommend 3 8 fuel line. They don't say what size it is. This is, in fact, 5 16 stepping up to 3 8 so this doesn't look awesome but I think it'll work the fuel lines gonna have to go over this lip and the clamps gonna have to go here and there's just enough room for it I don't know if that's intentional on their part and I don't really feel like sitting on the phone for 40 minutes on hold trying to find out um, I'm certain that this will work uh, so I don't know this is just seems stupid to me why would you do that I would have just stayed with the 5 16 fuel line you know, so if you guys want to learn something from this and you have a 5 16 fuel line, just stay with it. You know, the, if you've got an inline 6 like I do, you don't need a 3 8 fuel line. I just thought, well, this is 3 8 I'll upgrade. But totally unnecessary and a freaking waste of my time, to be honest, which will lead me to the next thing that I'm going to talk about here. And that is this fuel line. So here's the old fuel line. And, of course, it fit perfectly. I expected that the new one would have some problems, but not as many as it did. Uh, you know, I pretty much had to cut off this end and throw it away. You know, this is supposed to go up into the engine bay. It's about two feet too long. You know, it goes way up to the friggin' radiator. Sorry, I'm going on a little bit of a rant here. Did get the new one in, though. It pretty much fits. Um, so you can get it in here without removing the brake line or anything. It does go up above the brake line there, which makes it kind of a pain in the ass, but you gotta take this shock out, obviously, I have got it out. Um, it fit okay, I had to kind of finagle it a little bit, which I expected. And let's see if we can scoot you underneath the car here. Let's take a look. We'll take a look at what I did here. Pretty terrible view, but I've just got it kind of Pointing off there, I'm going to anchor it back to the frame there where the original clamp was. Um, this is just going to be terrible. Um, I went ahead and put new clamps on here and tried to utilize the old ones as much as possible. Um, there's one there and then there's one back there. 
uh, so the brake line and the uh, fuel line go through the same clamp. I utilize new ones and just use self-tapping screws. The old clamps were not in very good shape and they uh, were also for the 5 16th line. So um, I got it back there, but the, the big thing that I did want to mention was that I cut it off right here and I took my double flaring tool and I smushed the end of it with a double flare tool to get the to get the proper flare for the line to seal on the end there you can see it um, so and then I'll just use the vapor guard from there but I don't know what they were thinking but it had like another 290 degree bends in it and that went completely the wrong way and I don't know if it's for a V8 car where it's different I don't know but this is supposed to fit here and it doesn't so the hard part is done the new line is in I'm gonna get the tank back into it now get it all plumbed up and then we'll start talking about the wiring that goes from the fuel tank uh, for the sending unit and the pump and I'll uh, show you how I build the harness for that and the rest of it's just a whole lot easier it's under the hood I've got to get the coolant temperature sensor in which is gonna go right there where that one is um, I'm gonna move that one so we still got quite a bit of work we got to drain the coolant and uh, do all the under the hood stuff and the wiring so we'll go over that next there'll be a little bit more video of me actually doing that work you know it's not worth much showing you all this under here everybody knows what it's like to fight underneath a car yeah this just keeps getting better and better the line is way too long pointing the wrong direction so we're gonna have to cut it flare it so there's room to put the hose in there they only overlap by about two and a half inches you know just don't buy this freaking tube classic tube sucks uh, you know i almost had half a mind just to use the hose to go all the way to the front and just shove it up in the trans tunnel so it was protected but you know you're really not supposed to do that so i am going to do it right but really i mean <laughs> look at this crap so I'm going to cut that and I'm going to flare it. I'm going to cut it just below that line that I marked on there. and uh, So it gives me a little bit to flare and then we'll get the hose on there. So I did want to get you in here and see what I've done so far with the wiring. Um, I split off the purple wire, which is for the sending unit, which comes from over here. Um, unfortunately, I, I hate having to do this on such an original car, but there's really no choice. I had to take the original connector off the end and I spliced it. You can't see it, but it's back here. Uh, spliced it using uh, solder and uh, I use three to one heat shrink tubing. It's got the glue in it, so it seals out moisture. The glue melts inside of it. I'll show you it when I do the other ones. Um, I'll actually video it. Um, but I've got it tucked up under here. Um, I installed some clamps and then I use zip ties to hold the second piece of fluted tubing I had some of this laying around already I didn't have I'm short on the uh, nylon braid that I like to use um, I need it to go from the front to the back so I had to use this which is fine because it matches the other tubing um, but I just got that nice and tucked up in there you know um, fuel lines all hooked up uh, the weather pack connector is right over here I'm probably going to secure that just a little bit better than it is, but I got a couple clamps on it so far. So then what I'm going to do is the pigtail that's left, there's only going to be two wires. Um, both of these are ground, one's for the gauge, one's for the pump. I'm just going to share the ground. There's no reason I can't do that because I am going to bring a ground from the battery. Um, they tell you to do that. I'm not sure how good the chassis ground is way back here. So, you know, when you're pulling 10, 15 amps, um, you know, it matters. You want a good ground, so I'm going to run two number 12s back here, which should be plenty. Um, 12 gauge is good for 20 amps. And pump is about 10 or so, so that should be fine, considering drop and everything. But anyways, I'm going to take this. I'm going to put you up on a tripod here so you can see how I do it. Um, and I'll make up the connections for this. I've got my nylon braid over there. I already have it lined out on the ground. i got my wire. And... Uh, I'm going to pretty much just follow the fuel line back, and I'm just going to zip tie it to the fuel line, I think. I don't like using zip ties, but for this, it's a lightweight thing. If they're not going to rot away and fail or anything, um, it'll be all right. Uh, I may use some of my P-clips that I've got. 
and screw it in in a couple places. We'll see. But anyways, uh, so let's get these connections going. All right, so I'm going to attempt to do this while it's on camera and it's not a great angle and I'm pinned up against the wall in my yard, but I didn't feel like shuffling cars around today. Um, so, of course, I already forgot something that I got to go get. Um, we're going to be joining these together. I've put the two 12 gauges into the loom here. Um, this is all going to get sealed up nicely. I'm going to heat shrink these after they're soldered, all the, all the connections themselves, and then I'm going to heat shrink the two looms together just to keep them from coming apart, make it nice and neat. Um, so uh, I got to go grab my wire strippers. All right. Get these stripped down. I talked about this before. I'm uh, going to be utilizing the battery ground for both the gauge and the pump. It, it is irrelevant. I don't know why. In the instructions, they tell you to uh, they instruct you to use chassis ground for the gauge and the direct battery to the pump. It shouldn't make any difference in this case. So we're like I said, we're just going to combine them. Um, pre-tin the tips of these already too. They keep it to keep it from splaying out. Um, so I've got those. Um, I have a butane soldering iron, by the way. This is a real handy thing. It's a must when working on cars. Don't drag an extension cord out. And this thing heats up fast, like 30 seconds. It's hot instead of waiting for minutes to go by. Um, so, you know, I buy these little kits. You know, you can buy this stuff in bulk. I get these little kits though on Amazon. They last me quite a while because I just do this as a hobby. But this is three to one ratio, so it's high ratio with glue inside. And uh, I find that this stuff works real well. Um, so I'm just going to cut a little bit for each connection here. There's going to be two because I'm combining one of the uh, two of the three. So we've got that. Make sure you don't forget to put it on first um, because if you forget, then you're going to be unsoldering it. So that's not our fun. Um, so let me get this stripped here. And we're going to wire these together. All right, let's get these twisted together. Got my heat shrink tubing on there. You know, you just want a good physical connection. Never use solder to hold something together. You always want a physical connection holding it. Um, and of course, what do I do? I wire the first. This is what I, I'm talking and I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing. I want to hook that up to the ground. That would be bad. Gray wire is for the pump, which is red. And then I forgot to put the heat shrink tubing on. Well, you guys are just not going to get any good information out of me today, are you? our two grounds together here. I much prefer this, like I said, over doing crimps. Uh, crimps are no good. And I just realized those two wires, I'm going to need one size larger heat shrink tube. That's not going to work. Here we get. You want to make sure you use large enough, not so large that it doesn't shrink, but that's why I use this high ratio stuff because it does go down quite small. But you got to be able to get it over it once it's soldered, otherwise you're going to be redoing all your work physical connection here. Make sure you get a good physical connection. All right. I'll show you how fast the soldering iron heats up. Keep your heat shrink away. If you if you don't keep your heat shrink away from the where you're soldering, it'll just heat shrink on you and then you'll be stuck. So I'd start out with this thing, I just turn it on high and then once it's up to temp, I uh, Turn it down a little bit because you really don't need it up on super high to do electrical soldering with it. This thing's cool too. You can take the tip off of it and uh, it's a little tiny torch too. Um, so that comes in real handy. All right. So it's already hot. I mean, that's what I like about this thing. Let me 
just dial it down a little bit here. And it takes a little bit of heat when you're dealing with this much copper. You know, 12 gauge isn't exactly small. So we want to get it plenty hot where it'll wick into the wire. Just put a ball of solder on there. That doesn't work. You got to get it to where it wicks in there. That looks like that's doing pretty good there. Looks like solder iron's running out of butane. I'm going to have to go fill it. Yep, it is in fact out of butane. Well, that doesn't make for a very good video, but you get the idea. So we're going to do the same thing with this one, then we're going to do the heat shrink. i got to go refill this, though. So here I was telling you folks not to make a mistake, and what did I do? I forgot to put this piece of heat shrink tubing on right here. So I had to take it apart, but that's okay, because I didn't get to finish soldering that anyways, because my soldering iron ran out of butane. So we'll go ahead and get it, uh, go ahead and get it nice and soldered up now. And see what happened there? I wasn't paying attention. My heat shrink started to shrink on me. go it's not the best soldering job I've done but certainly acceptable by any standards it's fully wicked and it's got a good physical connection so it'll work just fine so now we can take our heat shrink tube go ahead and slide it on here uh, a heat gun is the proper way to do this, but I didn't feel like dragging my, uh, didn't feel like dragging my uh, cord out here for it, which is fine. I'll just hit it a few times with this uh, butane torch. You don't want to burn it. Just get the glue to melt. It's pretty decent there. Pretty decent job. Still, heat shrink tubing is still good here. I almost. I almost killed it, made a mistake. But we got that going there. All right. Decent. Not the greatest, but I'm working in not the best conditions if I was at my bench. This would be a whole lot easier. All right, so I stole some of the wire from up here, so I'm gonna pull some of it back. All right, that's pretty good. Get this up here. Let's see, I got a long enough piece of shrink tube here. Just, and we're just gonna slide this guy on here for a good clean install. Now you gotta be careful with this nylon braid when you heat it this nylon braid will burn. So we want to not do that. So I'm just going to hit it from afar just to get it to shrink. Like I said, the heat gun is the correct way to do this. Don't do it the way that I'm doing it. I'm just being lazy. That's pretty good. So that gives you a pretty decent uh, setup there. It's glued. Um, you know, it's not eh, it's not super pretty. It could have been better, but I'm working with what I got. I wish I had more nylon braid laying around, but I don't. All right, so this is all set to go here now. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get this routed the way that I want it. I'm going to get it up. I'm going to follow the fuel line back over here and uh, take it up to the front and then the rest of everything that we've got to do today is all up front everything in the rear and 
uh, laying on the ground for the most part, except for me finishing putting the cable in, it is done. So the, the, it'll be more fun working under the hood next. So I know you folks uh, don't want to miss a minute of this exceptional entertainment. I've moved the temperature sending unit for the gauge to the thermostat housing. Not the best place, but it's fine because the fuel injection is going to tell me the temperature with much more accuracy than the one in the than the stock one anyways. So I just went ahead and moved that there. I cut the end off and I soldered it onto a piece of 105 degree C rated uh, wire because it's close to the engine, 18 gauge. I've got to clean it up. Um, I haven't decided exactly what I want to do with the routing. I, I don't really like this. I'm probably just going to put some nylon braid on here once I get uh, once I get some more in. Um, so I just went ahead and spliced that in. So again, soldered, heat shrink, you know, that's the right way to do it. Uh, pulled the fuel pump off, put a blocking plate on there. It's a standard um, blocking plate for a big block Chevy. Um, works on the Fords apparently too, I guess. I don't know all the different makes and models, but um, it, it'll, uh, it's pretty common. Um, so it came with a gasket. It's a Summit brand. Um, I threw some right stuff on there just to make sure that it seals. Um, you need shorter bolts for it. They're uh, 5 16 18. Um, I just used actually some body bolts work just fine for it. Um, they've already got the washers on there and everything. So I just snugged those up nice and tight. This is a budget build. It's not fancy. So, you know, I'm not putting stainless or, you know, any nice ARP hardware in there. I just don't need it. Um, pop the uh, CTS in here uh, into the head for the fuel injection. Let's wait for the airplane to go by. Uh, I didn't even drain the coolant. I just, I lazed out and I, I popped it out and I popped it and I lost about three tablespoons of coolant. Just did it nice and quick. So it's just better than having to drain it. It's got fresh coolant in it. So I didn't feel like draining it, having to refill it. Took the carb off. Um, this is actually something that I'm not sure of. These heat riser pipes, I'm going to have to look into this. I don't know if these actually go down into the port or not. I'm going to find out here in a second. If it is, I'm either going to drill and tap it, probably drill and tap it, and uh, fill it with a bolt or some sort of a plug. Um, I'm going to figure that out in a minute. Um, it's just one of those things I honestly don't know. I haven't seen that before. Usually they aren't. Well, I don't usually keep exhaust manifold. That's probably why I usually put headers on everything that I eat, uh, build. So I don't know. I'm going to figure that out. Um, through the throttle body unit on here. I took the plug out. Um, I do have a later model distributor on here. Uh, that's what came, that's what it came with. Um, so, but they were drawing the vacuum off of the side of the Autolite 1100, but it wasn't, I don't know a lot about those Autolite 1100s, but it didn't have that spark, uh, whatchamacallit thing that looks like a power valve that um, changes the vacuum advance. Um, it didn't have that, it's not actually not ported on that particular carb. So I think the carb is probably a later model. I don't think it's original of the car, but it didn't doesn't have a lotomatic distributor. It's just got a regular mechanical vacuum advance distributor. Um, Holly tells you specifically, yeah, you can use this. They, they put it here so you can route your vacuum line the same way. They say you cannot use it with a lotomatic though. You, you have to have a mechanical advanced distributor uh, like I've got. Um, so this will work out real well. I'm going to put the adapter in here. I'll get this lined up. So I'm going to take a look at that next. Um, I've got my wires routed up here underneath the vehicle now for the fuel pump and ground. Uh, I just haven't decided exactly what route I'm going to take with that yet. I'm going to figure that out as I lay the harness in here. Um, this is where it's a little bit of an artwork. Um, so we're going to figure out how to make this nice and clean. Um, so let me finish up figuring this out. I'll let you know what goes on with that. And then I'll probably throw you up on a tripod so you guys can watch uh, how I'm going to get the wiring uh, situated in here. So I usually try and keep my head out of the video because I'm not the subject of it and I want you guys to be able to see what it is that I'm doing. But uh, in this case, I don't see any other ways, so you're going to have to look at my ugly mug. Um, You'll remember I uh, have the Earl's fuel injection vapor guard hose. It's ethanol safe, good hose. 
Um, I played around a little bit with how I wanted to route this. Um, I tried a couple different things. I wanted to use a gauge adapter that I normally use. That's what this is. Uh, I just couldn't do it, but I bought a couple different fittings for it just to play around with it and see how it was going to work. Um, it's just the air cleaner. You know, I knew this thinking about it, but I just, you know, I wanted to see if I could make it work, and I can't. Um, the air cleaner is not going to make it where it's going to clear, so it won't be quite as sexy. I'm going to use the hose clamp version that they sell. Um, so the way that this is going to route, is we're going to come up with the line. We're going to go to the filter, then the gauge, then the unit, because we want to know what the pressure is as close to the unit as possible without uh, any, well, I shouldn't say without, I, I want to make sure I don't have, I want to make sure I know the total status of the system. So that includes the filter. So I want to know what the pressure is post filter, if that makes sense. So um, we're going to go ahead and get this clamped onto my line down there. Um, I'll, let me get that on and then uh, I'll show you how we're going to do the rest uh, right here. All right. So we got all the components set to go here. I got filter in and out. This is a 10 micron filter, 10 microns minimum. I cannot express that more. The guys that put 40 micron filters going into the fuel injection units are the ones with the stuck injectors. Don't do that. 10 micron, always. If you're using a pre filter on an external pump, 40 micron. But always end with at least 10 going into the unit. Um, I just can't express that enough. I just, how many times I've helped people troubleshoot their fuel injection systems, they get stuck injectors, and, and it's just, anyways, I'll stop ranting. Um, I've got my fuel line connected down there, EFI rated clamps, Earl's EFI rated clamps, okay? Um, make sure I'm not too high here. <laughs> All right, um, so the Earl's EFI rated clamps. All right, uh, the rest of this is just going to kind of go in line. I'm probably going to want to tie it back at least here. Um, so I'll probably go to the strut tower with a clamp. And then um, I'm going to go ahead and cut it here, and I'll cut it here. All right, so I'll kind of wing this here a little bit. Like I said, the filter is going to go first. So... You know, I want it relatively close down here. I want to leave myself enough room. Um, so I'm just kind of figure this out as I go. By the way, these things are freaking handy right here. Um, I don't know if they still make them or not. These ones are probably 30 years old. Um, and they're made in the U.S. I'm sure they aren't anymore. But these craftsmen think they used to show these on the TV. I remember <laughs> they were like an infomercial. Uh, these things make the best cuts. All right, don't forget to put the clamp on. Make it in a way that's accessible for the for your driver to get to it. I'm going to do this with the, make sure, in and out, right? And I'm going to do this with the lettering facing down because, you know, let's try and make it as pretty as possible, you know? Get this seated all the way on there. Turn it a little bit. Make it in a way that I can easily clamp this down. For some reason, I think these are Swedish or Swiss. Let me see. Sweden, yeah. So uh, they're good quality European clamps, fuel injection rated clamps are the ones that Holly obviously brands somebody else's and uses it. Holly Earl's, same company. Um, it's seven millimeter, just FYI. I don't know exactly how tight to go with these. I just go till it looks good and feels good. So I think that's probably good. All right, that's going to be good there. And it'll leave just enough for me to put a clamp on here. P, a P clamp, that's what they're called. That's what those rubber insulated clamps are called. I need more of them. I got two packages. Um, so, 10 total, there's five in a pack. Let me get another piece of hose here, and I'm almost immediately going to go into the 
fuel pressure gauge. I, I, I just don't like this. I'm so used to doing AN and stuff like that. You know, this is just not nearly as neat and clean, but that's okay. Yeah, it doesn't have to be perfect. Like I said, this is more of a budget build. Um, so, you know, I want it to look good. I want, definitely want to do a good job, but I don't want it to be, you know, don't want to go over the top and spend $30,000. It's just too much. This one we can slide on first. Put the clamp on. Put another clamp on. I like them facing the same way just because it's neater that way. You know, so pay attention to the details. Especially if you're doing this for a living, you know, make it nice. These are all special fittings, by the way. These are Earl's Vapor Guard fittings, uh, specific for this hose and this setup, and for fuel injection, of course. Oh heck, let's just get the last piece on there and then I'll do all the clamps at the same time. One more piece. Make sure I leave enough to go back to where I want it to. It's probably pretty good right there. High precision measurements going on here, folks. All right. Put this end on, then drop both clamps. Make it easier. <laughs> Forgot to put the clamps on. I always do that. in all the same direction just satisfy my OCD there we go all right and then the rest of it's just tightening them all up so um, get them all nice and snug where they're Compressed a decent amount. I didn't really, I didn't, don't think I found any instructions on exactly how to use these, but I just do it till it feels right. You know, don't crank down on it till it snaps, but you know, get a pretty good feel for it being pretty tight. But that's probably pretty good right there. Before I tighten this, I'm going to adjust the gauge. I want it to kind of face generally in the direction that I want it to. It's a glycerin filled gauge too. You want glycerin filled, more accurate, stands up to vibration. We're going to pressure check all this too, so I'm going to fire the pump up to the unit separately just to make sure that we don't have any leaks. Oh, and before I tighten it down on the throttle body, that's the other thing I want to mention. I'm going to run fuel through it into a can for, you know, a quart or so of fuel, flush out anything that's in the line because we don't want anything past the filter, even st stuff can get past 10 micron filter, you don't want it to. Um, so we're going to take this and we're going to put it into a can and we're going to flush some fuel through the system just to clear out anything that might have ended up in there. So that'll be uh, next and I think I'm probably going to call it quits for today. There's uh, 
quite a bit still to do. Um, I'm going to do this all in one part. Uh, it's not a multi-part video. I, I want to keep this all as one segment. Um, so we'll get this posted up in a few days. Uh, but yeah, tomorrow we'll go ahead and do all the wiring. Get it done correctly. That pretty much does that. The only other thing I'm going to do, uh, this is the fuel inlet on this side. On the back side, because we're deadheading, as, I, as it's called, deadheading, we're going to put an AN cap on the rear. And that will tighten up the... Uh, the fuel system. So we'll flush this out tomorrow and we'll uh, get the wiring taken care of. So we'll be back with it. All right, so we're back for another day of fun. Um, I've gone ahead and put a fuel uh, tank right here uh, to flush the system. Um, I'm just going to wire it right to the battery for right now um, so that we can uh, just run the pump, see how it sounds, get some fuel flushing through it. Um, I'm just going to do this by hand, uh, so let's go ahead and flush some fuel through it. We've got uh, the line over here, and I'm just going to run it right to the battery. And I can tell you right now the pump is pretty quiet. I already got fuel coming out. Excellent. Very quiet, as a matter of fact. Probably can't hear it over the gardeners that are across the street, but um, yeah, this is good. All right, so I just ran, you know, a little bit of fuel through it. Um, you know, probably about a quart or so. I don't want to do too much, but just enough to flush the crap out of the line. You know, maybe I'll do a little bit more here. Oh yeah, excellent. So, perfect. Um, that was real easy. It primed fast. No problems. The pump is very quiet. I was worried because a lot of people were talking about how noisy the pump is. and Of course, that's free flow right now, so it might get louder when it's under pressure. Um, actually, it's almost certain it's going to get louder under pressure. But um, that's okay. You know, we'll, uh, we'll just go with it. We'll see what happens. So I went ahead and I snugged up the lines, and um, I actually ran it because uh, I wanted to hear what it sounded like when it was bypassing in the regulator in the rear under pressure. I checked I had 60 PSI. As a matter of fact, it's still holding some pressure, um, uh, and it's just as quiet. So I know. some folks are saying they're real loud. I don't know. It's only got five gallons in the tank, um, but I don't know. It doesn't sound loud to me, and you can barely hear it. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is install the oxygen sensor. Um, I put the bung in here a couple of weeks ago, uh, just when I was in here. I did a really crappy job of it, too, but you want to make sure that there's no pinholes in the weld. Um, it, it comes with the clamp. You can certainly use those. I don't like them. I don't like the clamp rounds. They don't seal. Sometimes the gasket blows out. The worst thing that can happen is getting oxygen into the line. That will make it run so horrible, and you'll be scratching your head trying to figure out why. Um, I always buy these uh, weld-in units. They work real well. Um, and I buy them with a plug because one of the things that you cannot do, you cannot install the oxygen sensor without it being powered, without it being hooked up to the unit. It will destroy it um, immediately. So don't do that. You know, stick a spark plug in there or get one that's got a plug. These are from ICT Billet. Um, so, I, you know, it's just got an Allen plug in it. I'll pop that out, and I'm going to go ahead and screw the oxygen sensor and get it nice and tight. We'll get it wired in, and then the rest of it's just going to be getting the wiring going here. Um, I'm going to disconnect the battery, and I'm going to figure out... It, it, the harness it comes with doesn't have uh, any loom on it or anything, so, of course, I'm going to do all that. Um, so I'm going to kind of see how it wants to lay out, and then I'll go ahead and I'll just do that all on video so you can see how I do it. So let me show you what we got here. I'm just figuring out how I'm going to route this. None of it is very awesome, but I almost wish they wouldn't pre-loom some of this stuff. But the way I think I'm going to go with this, um, I'm going to bring it from the unit. Here's the plug for the unit. Um, we need to pick up power. 
from the battery and they tell you directly from the battery, which I agree with, you want to keep it as far away from any interference as possible and you want to have a good solid ground. Um, this is the fuel pump wire. We're going to get that routed nicely over there. And then the pink um, is the ignition source. I haven't figured out exactly where I'm going to pull that from. I could take it from the coil, but you really want to stay away from that. Um, that's what causes RPM noise. So, uh, well, I'd call it RPM noise. I'm used to Phytech. That's what the error is. But noise on your tack signal, you want to avoid that. System sensitive to that. And I notice they intentionally give you a short lead because they want you to keep it as short as possible. But I, you know, I have to get it from the coil. I am starting the system non-timing control. And I recommend that everybody do that. It is very difficult to get one of these systems working with all of those variables. If you put a HyperSpark in a CD box and all that crap, it's a good thing to have. Um, I think for a stock setup, you don't, necessarily, you don't need a CD box. The, the, having the timing control is a positive thing. You do want to do that. Um, it's just too darn difficult. Get the thing running first with non-timing control then come back and add it. Uh, baby steps. I'm, otherwise, you just rip your hair out. I've done straight up timing control before, and it, you know, it can throw you for a loop. So, anyways, we'll get this routed along here. Um, the O2 sensor's in. Um, you know, everything's a mile too long. Um, I'm gonna zip tie this up. A note about zip tying these O2 lines: do not crush this to where this seals completely. This actually feeds oxygen into the sensor, believe it or not. Um, I'm not exactly sure why. I did read up a little bit on it some time ago. This tube needs to be able to breathe into the oxygen sensor. Um, so don't crush You can put a zip tie around it, just don't crush it. You, it needs to be able to breathe. Um, maybe I'll look that up and I can explain why that is. Um, I'm not certain if it's something to do with the measurement. Don't know. But I, I did read that at one point. So... Um, it just, you know, I read don't crush the tube. So, um, but I'm going to get that all neat and cleaned up. I'm probably going to add a harness. The, the coil line, I don't have a choice. I've got to extend it. But I'm going to keep it up on the firewall away um, from everything. Because we, we, we want it. I'm not going to wrap it with anything else. Um, because we don't want any noise on that, on that signal. Um, well, I may, depending on what, if it's just straight 12 volt sources like for the fuel pump it's not pwm or anything like that so it's not a noisy signal it's just straight 12 volts it's probably okay to wrap it together um, but you definitely want to keep it away from ignition sources so i'm going to have to very carefully put it along the side of the block to get to the coil um, it's got you know you don't want the secondary of the coil getting near it that'll just mess it up so anyways um i'm still got to figure out how to get this laid in here and then um, once i figure out exactly what route it's going to take we'll get that well, I feel like I'm just surrounded by frickin' gardeners today. It's like Thursday is gardener day in my neighborhood, and they're just all over the place. So I'm sorry if the audio sucks, because it does. Um, so here's what we got so far. Um, I went ahead and I made the connections for the power. Um, I deviated a little bit. Now, I mean, I'm okay with doing this, and, and I understand everything that's around me. Um, I didn't go directly to the battery post, but I did go to the battery cables. I'm a little concerned about the ground being so close to the alternator just because alternators are noisy, but it's just, that was the cleanest way to do the install. If I have to change it, I will. If I need to chase down a noise problem, I have the, I've got a scope and I've got the equipment to do it. Um, so I'm not too concerned about it, but I'm trying to give you guys good information. And if it, this works out well, I'll, you know, well, you're going to find out at the end of the video when we run it. But, um, I did go down there and I did go to the starter solenoid, the hot side of the starter solenoid for the power. It just, it's a nice clean install that way. Soldered, crimped soldered connections. Um, that's the best way to do those. Um, I think this is gonna work out well. I brought two grounds up. Uh, one, one goes into the harness already for the uh, sniper. And then I brought another ground wire up. This is to splice into my fuel pump sending unit ground. Um, so, um, We'll go ahead and we'll get that. Uh, we'll go ahead and get that situated, um, and we're gonna f uh, figure this part out. That's gonna be the hardest part to get clean. Um, so, uh, you know, 
I think the gardeners might be going away here, so I might be able to actually shoot some of this for you. Um, a little hard to see down there anyway, so, you know, what would have been the point of me videoing it? You know, you get the idea, you know, wire it up nice and clean. We want to keep it clean. That's the important thing. We don't want to run a bunch of stuff parallel. If you do have to cross wires, especially anything uh, ignition related, you know, make sure you do it at a 90 degree angle where you're going, you're going across it. You know, if this was, if this was the line, don't follow it, go across it. Um, so that's, that's good. You know, you want to try and keep a three or four inch separation. Um, so let me get you up on the tripod here and then we'll do, uh, we'll do a little bit more with this. Well, we've pretty much been listening to gardeners for the last two hours, so I'm just not getting everything I want to get, but I'll explain to you what I've done. Um, I went ahead and hooked up the ground for the uh, fuel pump slash sending unit, put it in the loom that I brought over. Um, I zip tied it up here. I don't like using zip ties, but it's kind of just part of this build. You know, I've got loom, I've got some zip ties, I've got some P-clips, so, or P-clamps. Um, so I hooked the blue wire to the red wire, which goes down to my fuel pump. And just as a note, I think the blue wire is pretty long. I don't think it's long enough to make it all the way to the back. Um, I opted to not use it for that, but it's pretty long. I mean, it'll go under the car a ways. Um, so I went ahead and I soldered the connections up for that. The ground goes down to the main ground battery cable. The hot port goes to the fuel pump relay right here. So we'll get this nice and clean right here. Hide my uh, connections in this. So it looks semi-professional. Kind of pains me to do some of this stuff this way. I really like to keep stuff super nice, but budget build. This is supposed to be my weekend cruiser that's not gonna cost a fortune. So, that actually came out all right. So I'm just following the uh, following the harness for the sniper. Um, comes around right here. I'm probably going to zip tie some of this together with the stock uh, harness as well. Let's see. Not sure what those wires are, but it'll be fine. All right. So that all looks pretty good. So we've got the hot hooked up. The main feed, that is, the ground, the fuel pump. Um, the only things that are left, ignition source, which I'm going to figure out right now where to get that from, and uh, the tack signal from the coil. And I just don't see any way around it. I'm going to have to uh, route that a way that I don't want to. And it's just going to go up around that way. I'm going to get myself some loom and... Uh, of course, now the wind's kicking up, so, you know, forget this being any kind of a decent video, because it won't be. Um, get myself some loom. I'm out of the small stuff is the problem. I might have to use some of that fluted tube that I've got, but um, I'm going to bring that around um, and get that onto the coil. I'm going to have to extend it, obviously. I've got some 18-gauge yellow that I can use. Um, and I'll just get that over to the coil. Hopefully we won't have any interference, but if we do, we'll, uh, we'll deal with it. So that'll be the next piece. Get that in the ignition source. And then that should, uh, other than the handheld, which I do want to route the handheld into the, into the car. Um, I'm going to have to pop a hole in the firewall for that, put a grommet in. Other than that, uh, you know, if I put the handheld out for right now, we can see if we can get it running. Um, that should get us into a pretty decent place. So uh, let me go ahead and work on these uh, two wires right here. Um, I'm not positive where I'm going to get the ignition source from yet. I may, I'd really like to keep it away from the coil. The coil is an excellent, the supply for the coil is a great source as far as what you want. You want something that's hot when you're starting and when it's running, both. Um, but the coil itself is going to introduce noise into the system. Um, I don't know how sensitive the snipers are to that or not, the Phytex are, so um, I don't know. I'm going to try and find a source uh, that is not near the coil. Well, the wind is finally subsiding a little bit, but I had to keep going because I have to get this done today. 
Um, it's blocking all my other vehicles right now. Um, so what I did was the pink for the ignition, which is the only thing that isn't hooked up yet, um, and the coil uh, signal going to the negative terminal of the coil. I ran a big piece of loom over here, put the uh, temperature gauge uh, that I extended in there as well. I, I don't think that that's going to interfere with anything. Like I said, I don't mind troubleshooting it if it does. I'm used to kind of dealing with those problems. Um, but I think it'll be fine. Um, I ran a big piece of loom all the way around. Um, I'm keeping it away from the spark plug wires as much as possible, especially around the coil. I've pointed the wire from the negative side going to the yellow wire, which is the coil signal for the sniper. Um, uh, ran it in it's down below. Um, it intersects all of these anyways, and they're far enough away. They're a couple inches away, um, and it goes up and into the unit. Um, the hardest thing I'm struggling with right now actually is finding a switched ignition source that I want to use. I mean, I could just very easily run this to the coil, but, you know, it makes me nervous um, tapping it in at the coil. I'm considering tapping it in where it comes out of the bulkhead connector, but that's just, I hate, I don't want to cut up the original harness if I can avoid it. Um, so I may do something stupid here and hook it up to the ignition source in the coil, but nah. I'm just asking for problems if I do that. I really want to stay away from there. Um, so um, give me some time to kind of figure out where I'm going to get source from without poking a hole in the firewall. There is a hole there, but it doesn't go through. Um, there's another uh, bulkhead behind it. Um, so I'm going to have to figure out where I'm going to tie this in at. I don't like using these things like I did here and. The reason I did is because I didn't want to cut off the standard connector. That's when I installed the Pertronix uh, ignition module. I really, really, really don't like using those, though. Um, so that's a no-no, but I did it anyways. Um, I don't want to do that again, especially for this. Um, so I'm going to figure out where we're going to get this from. I do need to poke a hole in the firewall for the connector for the screen anyways because I do want that permanently installed so I may just bring both wires through wherever I figure out that's going to be. Um, I have a center console in this car so I'm going to be real slick about it and we're going to put it in here so when you open this you'll be able to see the uh, screen and I think that's a perfect place for it because I don't use this for anything else so It'll kind of hide it, but if I want to view it, I just flip that open. Um, so I got to figure out where I'm going to get through, though, um, to utilize that space. So I don't know, I'm going to dig around, see where I can poke a hole in the firewall or use a hole that's already there. So I cheesed out just a little bit here. Um, it's just I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to get the 24 or the sorry 12 volts from. Uh, this is the source that I need. I tapped into it back here. I hate destroying original harnesses, but at this point, you know, what the hell. Um, so I wide it in here. It's a good soldered connection. Two pieces of uh, heat shrink tubing. One of them for the electrical connection. The other one is to put the tube, to seal the tube up on here. Um, this is an okay way to do it. You know, I say it's cheesy, but there's really nothing wrong with it. The, the whole idea is to keep this wire where the source is coming from. You want to keep it as far away from here as possible. Um, I think that's a good compromise. So, you know, I, I, looking at this, I don't see that there's a good place to drill a hole in this firewall. You know, I'm, I've got to put the connector in for the screen. I'd really like to have that, but I'm really going to have to think about where I'm going to put a hole. I'm thinking the passenger side is probably the best place. There's more real estate over there. So, yeah, not a lot of room in these things. Um, so, anyways, let me get this sealed up with some heat shrink. Uh, again, it's not the best, not the most preferred setup here. I really should solder this, just cut this connector off and just do this right. Um, the important thing is I know it's not right. <laughs> that's the important thing. And the folks that don't know that this is not right, that's more important that you that you know that it's not right um it's not giving me any problems i just don't like using those those things are cheesy all right let me get this sealed up all right let's get this party started so um 
I decided I'm going to figure out the wiring for this later for the handheld. Um, you don't have to have it left in place. I like to have it. It gives me gauges that are far more accurate than the crappy gauges that are <laughs> available. Um, so we're going to go through, we're going to do the initial setup. I went through the manual just again, just to be sure that I didn't miss anything. Um, uh, no wiring mistakes or anything like that. It all looks pretty good. So the, what they tell you to do, once that's all good, is to put the key in run position. They said the screen should come up. I'm not familiar with the sniper systems nearly as well, but I'm going to sit here and fumble through it. So turn the key on. Let's see if the screen comes up. And it does. All right. Um, I guess wizards, I think, is what it said. I'm going to wing this because it's fun to do it that way. Um... And we're going to go to the auto light 1100 screen. Oops. Maybe you scroll. That's interesting. Why is it not? That's not what I want. It says to do this, to go to the wizards. Wizard screen, so... Why does it not know what unit I have? Is there a way to scroll on? Oh, there it is. I can't see it through the camera. There we go. See? And... So this is a 550-552. There it is. 550-552. So we're going to select that guy. Next. Six. Next. Engine displacement, this thing is a 203. I wonder if you can do a direct. You can. Okay, yeah, so we can clear this. This is just easier to just do a direct setting here. 203, because it's a 30 over motor. So 203 would be close. It's not that critical. It, in my experience, I've learned. All right, 203, target idle speed. Let's set it to... 650 for right now, not 6250. 650. Save. Well, no. <laughs> Same problem as the Phytex, man. These touch screens just suck. Save. Okay, next is got a stock mild cam. It's just a stock cam that's in this. It is a coil minus setup. And that's it, it should do the build uh, now. Please cycle the ignition to complete the operation. Okay, well, turned it off. I don't know, I'll wait a few minutes, or not even a few minutes, just, you know, 10 seconds or something, I don't know. Didn't say to wait, so maybe I don't need to. Yeah, I heard the fuel pump run. Well, I don't know. Give it a start. Well, look at that. It fired right up. Shit. <laughs> okay. Let's see if it keeps running. Sounds good. So... Um, I don't want to run it too long without the air cleaner on it, but uh, it fired right up. You know, I mean, it needed to prime just a little bit. I'm sure that the throttle body needed to get some fuel on it. Um, sounds great. So we'll let it warm up. Um, that was pretty trouble-free, uh, same way my Phytech was. Uh, it just fired right up, you know. The fuel pressure's a little bit high. But that's okay, it's right around 60, and that, there could be some error in the gauge as well. Um, it'll be fine. It'll, it can compensate anywhere around those numbers. So, all right, well, we're going to let it warm up, and uh, we'll come back once it's getting into closed-loop mode uh, temperature. All right, so we are now at 173 degrees, which means I can set the IAC. I want that to be between 2 and 10%. Now they purposely, I could tell by looking at it, set the, pro the throttle plate 
open very far. I actually backed it off a little. It was idling a little too high for my liking when it's cold. Um, so I'm going to take and I'm going to back the screw off until this is between 2 and 10%. Now because it's open more than it needs to be, backing it off, it won't screw up the TPS setting because it can't go negative. The TPS can't go negative. Now if you have to open it more, then uh, it, you have to cycle the ignition key after setting it. So let me see if I can still see this over here, try and keep an eye on it. And I'm going to try and get it between 2 and 10%. Um, and I can't see it there, so I'm going to have to bring it over. All right, now I can see it. I want that to be between 2 and 10%. So that's right at two. Um, seems like it's idling awful low. I don't know if I like that. I may set the idle a little bit higher. The AFR looks good though. It's in learning, it's in closed loop. Uh, we're at 193 degrees, which is fine. Um, that means that the thermostat should be open. Feels like it's not quite yet, but um, it should be and uh, it's idling about where it should be. I may bump that idle speed up a little bit. I think that's a little too low. So, um, you know, let me take a look at a few things here. I'm going to see what it's like in gear. Um, I think I'm going to bump the idle speed up to 700 or 750 or so. Um, when I drop it in gear, it should compensate with the IAC, um, but it still feels like it's a little low to me. All right, so I got... Uh, the IAC set a little bit better. I'm running about 800 RPM. That's a little high for this motor, but this thing's never really liked idling low, so they're supposed to idle at 650 or something, but I don't know. It's just maybe the balance on this motor isn't good. So you can see it's taking fuel away. So currently it's minus three, minus four. It's been kind of been fluctuating. I know it was a little bit rich because the first time I popped the throttle, it stalled and I could see a whole bunch of fuel spray. Um, I do want to go over the fuel pump as well. Um, the fuel pump is very quiet. I mean, you just can't hear it. I mean, I can hear it in the trunk, but it's, it's quite quiet. We'll just be silent for a second. So you can hear it, but it's not loud, and you certainly can't hear it in the car, and you can't hear it over the engine at all, and it, you can hardly hear it when it's priming. So I don't know what anybody's talking about with that fuel pump being loud, but it's silent. I'm very happy with it. It's quieter than any other fuel pump I've got. So, I'm um, just letting it run here for a little while. You know, we're going to monitor it. Uh, I'm going to watch the temperature. Um, obviously, the thermostat's open now. It's kind of a cool day, so it's probably got a 180 degree thermostat in it. It's hanging right around there. It's learning. It's in closed loop. Uh, I'm going to throw it in gear here in a little bit and see how it feels, and then I might get things cleaned up and take it around the block, fill it up with some gas. So. Overall, it's kind of what I expected, you know. You do a clean install, you get a clean job out of it. Um, I've still got to clean up. I want to bunch some of these up right here. I want to clean up the C, the uh, O2. Other than that, everything seems fine. Oh, and the other thing I forgot to mention, I did drill this eight, uh, 5 16 18, and I plugged it. I don't know if it needed to be or not, but I, it looked like it went through, so I plugged it. Um, so, yeah, very happy. Um, it's, you know, we'll drive it and see if I'm as happy as I am right now, you know, proof is in the pudding, but it's going to learn. It's going to learn. It's going to stumble a few times before it kind of comes out of all that. So, um, pretty good. All right. So I just went and did a couple of things. I did find a place to bring the handheld, uh, in, um, you know, I do want to zip tie that back. That's the only thing I haven't done yet. Um, drilled a hole and put a grommet in down there. Cleaned up some of the wiring, got the air filter on it. It was a bolt-on thing, no problems. And I'll show you what I did with the handheld. And since I've got a console, 
fits perfectly in there. So I just bent some flat stock steel and used some Velcro. And, you know, it's not great, but it'll certainly it won't go anywhere, you know, if you're trying to touch it all the time, but I shouldn't have to. Um, so that works out real clean, I think, like that. Um, so I can monitor everything from there with the gauges. It's pretty, pretty cool. Um, so uh, it's only got a few gallons of gas in it. The only thing I'm noticing so far is it looks to me, I know with five gallons in this thing, it should be at about a quarter of a tank and it's showing on empty. Um, the gauge is moving, so I know it's working, but I think the float may not be as accurate as the original. Um, so we're going to go spill some gas in it and see. I don't mind it reading a little bit low as long as I know that it's reading low. Um, so we'll fill it up full and see see what it does. Um, but I do know if it's straight on the line for E, it's definitely got five gallons in it. So we'll see. Um, it's definitely after I let it idle for a little while, it was definitely running better. Um, you know, it's definitely learning. Um, I put it in gear a few, time, few times. I dropped the idle down to 750. It's running better. Um, so all good. I mean, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to. Uh, so, so far I'm happy. We'll see how it drives though. I've got, have yet to do that. So, um, we'll give it a shot. Well, I don't know if the float was stuck or what, but now it's reading, right. I pulled forward a little bit, which just same elevation, same angle and everything. And it's reading, you know, a little under quarter tank, which I guess would be right for a 16 gallon tank with five gallons in it. Um, so that makes me a lot more happy. Uh, that seems like that's working okay. So uh, well, I think we're going to call this one good. I'm going to take it down to the gas station, which is about a block away, and fill it up. Maybe toot it around the neighborhood, you know, and see how she runs. Um, overall, it's way better. Way better than the auto light. I can drop it in gear, and it compensates, uh, you know. It's idling just like it should. It's smoother, way smoother. Um, you know, so I'm happy. Looks good. Looks real good. Um, so hopefully you guys enjoyed this. You know, I'm sorry if the noise in the background while I was doing the wiring wasn't very good, but, um, and I didn't get to record as much as I wanted to, but, um, I think you get the gist of it, you know, keep the wiring clean, flush the fuel system. You know, these little tips will help you big time. Uh, it just makes the system work like it's supposed to. Um, so anyways, I think we're going to go ahead and we'll wrap this one up. I may do an update after I drive it a little bit and see, uh, you know, see how it is. I think, um, you know, if I'm, if it's positive or negative, either way, I'm going to do a second part video on, on, uh, how well it's running. So anyways, um, I'm Mectrician one and, uh, go ahead and like, and subscribe and, uh, we'll see you in the next one.